So the first session kicks off with global asset allocation in the world 2030 and beyond. And it is my great pleasure to invite Somnath Mukherjee, our fellow charter holder, CIO and senior managing partner, Ask Wealth Advisors. Just as a very brief intro, Somnath runs the investment strategy, product advisory and international wealth management business for ASK Private Wealth. He has over 20 years of experience in wealth management, private banking, and global markets with ASK Private Wealth and Standard Chartered Bank across India and Singapore. Educationally, he holds an MBA degree from IIM Calcutta and a bachelor's degree from University of Delhi. He also holds a CFA, he is a fellow charter holder, and FRM charters from respectively CFA Institute and Global Association of Risk Professionals. Uh, with that, I invite Mr. Somnath. Thank you so much. Okay, this works. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. And it's uh, my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce Wouter. Wouter comes from Northern Trust all the way from sunny Amsterdam. Uh, slightly less sunny than Mumbai right, right, right now. Um, so Wouter will be uh, taking us, he's the Chief Investment Strategist for EMEA and APAC of Northern Trust, uh, Northern Trust Bank. And he'll be taking us through a session on uh, global asset allocation. Uh, the format we are going to follow is, he's going to have a, a 20, 25 minute presentation where he'll take us through the key insights uh, for 2023, and then we'll follow it up with a, uh, with a half an hour Q&A. Wout up. Well, hello everyone, and thank you for having me here today in India. My to my shame, my first visit to your wonderful country. But it is a joy to be here, even though I have to admit, indeed, that my children right now in sunny Amsterdam are literally playing in the snow. Uh, I'm here in sunny India, sending them pictures of the pool and the, and the lovely Bay Area here. So I think I've got the right trade here. Um, but it's great to be here in, in your wonderful country, and especially with all the things that Nick has just said around the future and the growing importance of India it really feels very much overdue uh, to, speaking you to speaking to you here today. As someone has already said, what I want to do in 20, 25 minutes tops is really go through what we think are the most important themes from a strategic asset allocation perspective. I will also show you what sort of conclusions we draw from that in terms of our asset allocation forecasts. But not only that, I will also do something that most of my colleagues are not too happy about. I'm actually going to show you how we did over the last five years and tell you a little bit about the lessons that we learned from that experience. And then I'm going to pivot to 2023, the year ahead. There's lots of interesting stuff happening, as you all know. And I want you, I want you to know what we are drawing away from those events and, of course, how we're positioning ourselves. So with no further delay, let's kick it off with those goals. Now, before I do, it is important for you to know the way we structure our asset allocation process, which is fairly standard from an industry perspective. We have a five-year strategic forecast horizon, five years because we feel that actually better aligns with the forecast horizon of our clients. Most of our competitors use seven or 10 years. We bring it in a little bit closer because we see in practice that our clients actually don't really have the stomach to sit out seven to 10 years of, let's say, disappointing returns. So five years actually better aligns in practice with what they're doing. And of course, five years is pretty long. And you don't want to be, uh, you don't want to be static in that time horizon. You want to be actually uh, reacting to the events of the world. You want to be able to nimbly uh, take opportunities and of course take risk off the table as well. And that's why we have a tactical process alongside our strategic process, 12 month horizon, which really, again, once allows us to actually responds to the events of the day. So when we do our, uh, our five-year forecast, which is an annual process, it's important for you to know that we do it for everyone in the world. So this is a process where actually Northern Trust will bring all the experts in, we get together in a room, 
equity, fixed income, multi-asset, alternatives, and we bring in all those experts and we come up with one global house view. We don't have separate views from separate teams. We don't have separate views for separate parts of the world. One house view for everyone. That's the way we want to communicate with our clients. We are historically aware, but forward looking. So historically aware means we know our risk models. We know how we want to construct for each and every asset class from the bottom up, our forecast, but we also don't want to ignore what we think are the important trends of the future. So we will adjust our forecast depending on the views that we have looking forward. That structure is really important to us because we don't want to be just backward looking. And as has already been mentioned today in fixed income, that is particularly important today because clearly we are living in a new world of interest rates and cash rates in particular, and you want to be responsive to that. So, with no further ado, let's kick it off with the themes. Now, at Northern Trust Asset Management, we think themes are really important. And that's, yes, that may sound a little bit fluffy. Most of us enjoy quantitative modeling, and we want to see numbers and figures. And the themes actually you know, may sound a little bit fluffy to you. But trust me, they're not. What do themes do? They give you a benchmark horizon on which to build. They give you a red line that you can follow once the information comes in. They act as a filter of incoming information. So thematics around growth, inflation, monetary policy, geopolitics, and in this particular case, of course, the interest rate environment, give you a foundation on which to build your forecast and gives you a filter on which to uh, go through incoming information and allows you to actually stay the course while also allowing you to understand what is changing relative to your baseline and what is actually coming in in line with your baseline expectations. So themes to us are really important. And they also, of course, allow you to do what we're doing today. Under, make you, give you a storyboard, a understanding of the way we're looking at the world without having to go through all sort of endless figures and graphs. So the themes I'm gonna be discussing today at depth are the growth, inflation, and monetary policy themes. But that doesn't mean that the supporting themes in terms of regionalization, which is geopolitical in nature, in terms of the not so negative theme, which is all about cash rates moving higher, and of course, the green transition, which is still a go, it's not that those aren't important. We still think that those matter as well. But they are the supporting cast. Of course, you do want to focus on growth monetary and policy, in, sorry, growth monetary policy and inflation as your core running themes. And, so, and one word I want you to really take to heart when you think about these themes is the word security. I think most of you have already felt for the last 12 months that security has taken on a whole new meaning. But for us, it's been really important to think about security in the context of all of these themes. So what am I talking about? Physical security. The invasion of, Russia, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia has really, for Europe at least, but I think across the world, has put physical security on a whole new level of importance. So we actually expect that around the world, the investments in physical security, which is armies and infrastructure, is really going to ramp up. Not only that, associated with that same invasion, of course, energy security has taken on a whole new meaning as well. So energy security, especially from an Asian and European perspective, regions that don't historically have a lot of domestically sourced fossil fuels, means heavy investments in things like renewable energy provisioning as well as nuclear power. So energy security, a really important change as well that has come to the fore over the last 12 months. But through the pandemic, we've also experienced supply chain security issues. We've, we've understood as a world that resiliency and redundancy in supply chains is actually not a luxury, it's a necessity. And that is something that we think is gonna be really important, especially when you think about the outlook for corporate profitability Something really important to keep in mind. If we're going to be investing in those things, we should be also willing to incur the cost associated with it. And then finally, and I know this is really close to India's heart, technological security. Again, we've realized through the pandemic that having access to vital technology, semiconductors was a really good story in that regard, is absolutely essential for our economies. We cannot rely on other regions, other parts of the world to keep supplying us with these engines of future economic growth without having any sense of their availability when we need them. So what we're seeing now is that technological security is becoming really important for countries, for regions, 
to make sure that they have a diversified access, and again, India is going to be a big beneficiary of this, I think, diversified access to technology, but also to have, to have regionalized access as well. So that's why we're seeing in Europe the European CHIPS Act uh, being uh, passed, and of course in the US, the equivalent CHIPS Act as well. That is all part of that security question. So security in all these different dimensions is going to take on a whole new meaning. And again, the green transition theme, for instance, plays into that, because if you want to have energy security, you better invest in those renewables as well as nuclear power sources. So let's zoom in for a second here on what's happening on the growth side of things. As you can see here, we do think growth is going to be slower over the next five years than it has been uh, over the last five years. We call it slow growth transitions, which has that slow growth part to it, but the transition part as well. And the real core concept here is that the security questions I just raised and some of the answers I gave do come at a cost. You want to invest more in fiscal security? That's expensive. We all know it is. You want to transition from fossil fuels to renewables? Yes, by the end of that transition, you're going to have much cheaper marginal energy provisioning, but the transition itself is still very costly, and you're giving up that immediate, very efficient fossil fuel access. And then, of course, technological security, again, resiliency, redundancy, yes, it's important, but it's not free. So it's going to come at a cost. And those transitions, we think, are headwinds to the growth uh, outlook for the world, and you can see that here in, uh, in the way we've, uh, we've structured those, with one exception, and that's India. So India, because of its demographic tailwinds, because of the technological changes that Nick alluded to, and because of its growing role in the world, actually has a better outlook in terms of its growth uh, forecast than the rest of the world. So this is a place that we are taking more and more seriously and that we're looking at much more closely. Looking at the inflation outlook, this is, of course, something that people have been focused on very much over the last year because the inflation shock we've all gone through has you know, really reset. The global reset, well, in terms of inflation, certainly we've seen a reset. And the way people look at inflation and the way people act on inflation. And we do think that inflation has recalibrated to a higher level than what we had pre-pandemic. And that's important. At the same time, you can see here from the numbers that we do expect central banks to be largely successful in bringing inflation down to much more reasonable levels. So it's a combination message here. In the short term, over the next 12 months, we do expect inflation to come down meaningfully. Central banks have tightened materially, and we think that's having an impact. But at the same time, the 1.7% inflation level that we had in the US prior to the pandemic, we don't think that's coming back. There are labor shortages that we have to contend with, and the investments in security that I just mentioned, they do come at an inflationary cost. So we do expect inflation to re recalibrate at a higher level. Again, very important when we go to the asset class forecasts. And finally, very much related to the inflation outlook, we have a monetary drought. We have lived for 10 years in a world where central banks were so supportive. Everything they did seemed to be focused on giving us, as investors, the support that we needed to keep on investing and make wonderful returns. No more. Central banks have pivoted. They've pivoted hard. They've seen their inflation mandates threatened, and they said, this is not going to end in the way that we fear it's going to end. This is not going to be, be a repeat of the 70s and the 80s. We are going to hammer the inflation hard, and we're going to do it quickly to reestablish our credibility and make sure that this is a one-off shock that is not repeated. And that, of course, means that from an investor perspective, the reality is that your monetary flood has turned into a monetary drought. There's going to be much tighter policy going forward. The rates are going to come down from current levels because we're pushing into restrictive territory as we speak, but it's not going to be as supportive as, we, as we've experienced over the last 10 years. Again, very important to think about when we turn to the asset class forecast, which, here we go, we should do now. So the asset class forecasts are really predicated on the central messages that I've just said. Security, higher inflation, uh, <laughs> tighter monetary policy, all of that combined gives you this set of asset class forecasts, which has a couple of key messages associated with it. First, on the fixed income side, better return forecasts. Higher interest rates, we all know how important that coupon is in driving your total return, gives you a much better outlook now than we've had over the last five years. That's a positive message. At the same time, on the equity front, 
the realization that the profit margins that we faced, which have been very elevated, are going to come under downward pressure because of that uh, transition that we're going through, because of the investments made in uh, resiliency redundancy, because of the, uh, the cost of the upfront investments in the green transition, that is going to come at a cost in the profit margin spectrum of the equity market outlook. So even though our starting point has improved, because markets are down 20% over the last 12 months, we do think that the, uh, that the uh, return forecast is going to be held back by that dimension. So that's the equity part of the forecast here. And finally, on the private assets side, that's where we still see attractive returns. So private assets is still an area that we see uh, deliver strong returns that we have seen uh, uh, being able to deliver uh, alpha as well as beta returns, and it's still something that our clients are moving forward on in terms of allocating more of their resources. So private assets are certainly an area that we still think are going to stand out in a positive sense in this total return spectrum. Now, when we talk about the equity market forecast, it is important to sort of disentangle what we're talking about here. So on the revenue side, uh, when we talk about the building blocks of equity market forecast, on the revenue side, that slow growth transition is going to hold back the returns a little bit. But the really important thing that we're talking about when we say profit margins are going to be under downward pressure is that bottom bar there that you see in negative territory. So it is very important for us to impress upon our clients that even though the world may not be the scariest place uh, out there, there is a fundamental cost associated with the structural changes that we are facing. And not realizing that, not looking at those very elevated profit margins as they stand today, and putting that picture up is important because we do need to manage those expectations. We do need to underline what's happening there. Valuation-wise, like I said, um, we don't see a massive pickup from current levels. We had a big reduction in valuation levels. Again, all part of the market uh, spectrum that we faced for the last 12 months. But the pickup, we think, is going to be held back by that change in interest rate environment. Right? We, we are facing higher interest rates. We are facing that monetary drought that is going to keep valuation levels somewhat uh, depressed. Not terribly. There is a small expansion, but clearly not nearly as much of an expansion as the uh, reduction that we've seen over the last 12 months. Finally, diversification is going to be important. And real assets, we think, are playing a more important role in that uh, respect, particularly on the natural resources side. We are looking at the diversification benefits. When we see big regions like India, but also China, reopen in 2023, we do think that the demand for those natural resources that we've all come to rely on is going to pick up. And if you're looking for a diversifying asset to play into such a surge, that's the place to be. So diversification still matters, and natural resources is an area that we are particularly focused on. Finally, uh, the report card, the dreaded report card, the one that Ravi kind of doesn't want me to show you, but I am going to do it anyway because I think there are important lessons here. So looking at this chart, looking at what we actually said was going to happen uh, and what actually happened, you might be forgiven for having wasted the last 15 minutes of your time. Because clearly, clearly, we got a couple of really big things wrong. But that's really not the message that we're sending here. The message we're sending here is it's really difficult to forecast individual asset classes. Things change. Within your five-year window, things change. And you need a tactical process to attack those changes and benefit from them, which is actually something that we did by being overweight developed markets and underweight emerging markets throughout most of this five-year period. But finally, and perhaps the most important lesson I want you to take away from this, is that once you build a well-diversified, well-constructed portfolio from those individual asset classes, even though you may be wrong at the individual asset class level with respect to your precise forecast, things do actually come out rather close to where you expect them to come out if you have a well-constructed uh, asset allocation process. And that's what you see here with the strategic asset allocation returns actually coming in really close to target. And that matters because when we talk to our clients about the outlook, about what they can expect from the world going forward, this is what they're actually going to see at the end of the, in the road. And they need to know roughly what they can expect from their portfolio so that they can manage their expectations, so that they can manage their wealth accordingly. So this is a message, despite the fact that the previous slide might look really bad, 
the message we are really eager to send and really eager to share. So that's the strategic side of the equation. Now quickly on to the tactical side. So this is the 2023 forecast. And it's really important, I think, to realize that the things that happened in 2022 are still very, very important for the forecast for 2023. 2022 was a horrible year. We actually said to our clients at the start of 2022 that the inflation side of the equation was going to be very, very important to them. And if we got it wrong, if inflation was going to be higher than expected, then the investment returns were likely going to disappoint to the downside. And unfortunately, we were right. And we didn't uh, anticipate how wrong we would be on the inflation side. This is a full, honest disclosure. We underestimated the inflationary side of the surge. And as a result, we also underestimated how difficult a year it would be for my multi-asset portfolio. Of course, we responded. We did, in the end, make a couple of good decisions in uh, dampening some of the pain that we saw in fixed income and, of course, in the equity market as well. But, of course, um, it, was really, it was a really tough year to navigate. But looking forward, it's important to realize that the inflationary dynamics are still with us. We still have elevated headline inflation, even though the trends are now down. That's still with us. We still have the profit margin pressures to contend with. We still have the uncertainty of the war in Ukraine to contend with. We still have the energy cycle to contend with. So the things that, that took us back in terms of our uh, returns in 2022 are still lingering in 2023, and we need to think about what that means. And this is the core message that we are taking away for 2023 in that regard, which is right now, the pressures that we're put on the global economy in 2022, which are pushing still into 2023, are creating a fundamental headwind to the financial market outlook. That is the reality that we are facing right now. And by fundamental economic headwind, I mean that elevated inflation and slowing growth are still putting downward pressure on things like revenue growth in companies, still putting downward pressure on the outlook for, for instance, uh, fixed income through central bank policy. But as we expect that these uncertainties around energy, around the invasion in Ukraine, but most importantly, the uncertainty around where central banks will land in terms of their monetary policy, when those uncertainties dissipate and the fundamental headwinds are clarified in investors' minds as soon as they start to know where they actually stand in terms of the revenue growth outlook, where they actually stand in terms of the profit outlook, that's when we expect that the sentiment side of the financial market spectrum might actually improve. And we've already seen glimmers of that in the last couple of weeks. We've seen glimmers how uh, markets have responded in a positive sense to, a bit, to an improvement in the fundamental outlook. Energy prices dropping, European equities outperforming is a good example of that. But that's the fundamental push and pull we expect in 2023. Fundamental headwinds, sentiment upside, and the sentiment upside will probably be truly released when central banks have reached their plateau, have passed their central bank tightening cycle, and have moved on towards a more data-dependent, forward-looking monetary policy mix that will be responsive, but not uh, as aggressive as we've seen over the last 12 months. The way we structure that argument is by looking at growth and inflation, as well as uh, the, the policy outlook, and on growth and inflation, it should be clear that we do think the fundamental headwinds are still here. So we do still think there's a disappointing growth outlook in the US. But Europe and China have actually improved a little bit. So that's why, because of the energy price outlook and because of the reopening, of course, in China. So that's why we are starting to see glimmers of, a, of an improvement. But the inflation side there is still, uh, is still challenging uh, in terms of where we are, where we are trending. The way we look at it in terms of the policy side of things, and I'm going fast here because I want to get to the Q&A, um, is, is how we are looking at the Fed as still being in this more restrictive territory. Although, again, yesterday, glimmers are starting to appear. We had another Fed governor saying we should move to 25 basis point increments and slow things down uh, and see how the cumulative impact of those past interest rate increases filters into 2023, impacts the growth outlook, impacts the inflation outlook, and then be data dependent, forward looking, meeting by meeting. So things are moving in that direction, but it's still, uh, we still need a majority of the board to say so, and that, that hasn't been the case yet. 
Uh, so what does that mean in terms of our scenarios for 2023? Like I said, we still face from a strategic bench, sorry, from a tactical benchmark perspective, fundamental downside and sentiment upside. That sentiment upside can be quite strong once it is released. So we are really, in our ESTA location, we are really focused on signs that the market is turning around, that monetary policy is going on pause, and that we are going to see that improvement. But for now, the fundamental downside, and again, we saw a glimmer of that when we saw the retail sales and industrial production report in the U.S., and we saw the market reaction. We still need to be very much on the lookout for that. Not only that, China, which is playing a very important role in the global economy, that's, that's a bumpy ride that it's going to be facing. We do expect there to be a reopening, and there should be a lot of pent-up demand released there. But let's not kid ourselves. It's not going to be that easy to get there. And there's going to be a lot of bumpiness along the way. Of course, inflation needs to be watched and is both a base case as well as a risk case for us. Our base case is inflation is coming down. Uh, energy prices are a big part of that, but we also don't see the wage price spiral that a lot of people are worried about. So inflation is coming down, but is it going to come down quickly enough? And what about those sticky components? Are they truly sticky or perhaps not so much? Something very important to watch, not just for financial markets, but as well from a fun fundamental perspective, because central banks could also pause and then restart a tightening cycle, which of course would be very challenging for financial markets. So this is the way we're positioned. We're taking cash and high yield over investment grade because we like the spread in high yield. We like how you're being rewarded uh, for, the fund for the default risk, but um, uh, it's not uh, it's not a huge bet that we're taking there. And then, of course, we have an EM equity underweight because of the concerns we've had about China versus a natural resources overweight because if China does reopen aggressively, we do think that's how you want to be positioned uh, in the world. Risk cases, always important to round off on those. We do need to watch these because the world is uncertain and risk is always there. So what are our risk cases? Clearly, sticky inflation through the labor market is a big risk case. So that's what we're watching very, very closely. And we have to realize that with respect to Ukraine, but also with respect to China reopening, there is still risk there as well. If China doesn't get its economy restarted, that's going to be a risk case. If the situation in Ukraine escalates, that's going to be a risk case as well. So those things need to be watched. All right, I'm over time. I'm sorry, Samnath. I hope it's not too bad. Thank you very much. Let's go into Q&A. Thanks, uh, thanks, Walter. I'll jump straight into uh, some of the topical, and this audience is predominantly Indian, so uh, some of the more topical points of interest. First up, uh, money managers like this whole strategic asset allocation, tactical asset allocation business, right? But with business cycles and market cycles becoming so short, um, is it all narcissism or very, very minor differences? No, I mean, so <laughs> it's a good question. I do think there's a tension. And sometimes you see the tension when you actually go through the annual process and you go through the monthly uh, tactical process as well. So strategically, you do annually. Uh, tactically, you do monthly. And, and then people say, well, we're doing a five-year exercise here, but really, next year, we're going to revisit. So is it really a one-year exercise? And then you do your annual forecast on a monthly basis. And so people say, well, are we really doing it on a monthly basis? So yes, there is a little bit of Tactical creep is how I would put it, in the way you organize yourself. But again, I will come back to the fact that those themes that we set, they really do act as a filter for us. We really look at the incoming information, and particularly on the central banking side, and setting our plateau rates and how we think they're going to come down, and where the neutral rate is. So it's a mix. So you're, I would say I'm halfway your, uh, where you are. Mm -hmm. But the other part of me says, no, we are still trying to look beyond the short term. We are really trying to look at structural trends. So it's a mix, All right. but I do take your criticism to heart. <laughs> and, uh, somewhat related question. <clears throat> I was interested in uh, what you put up as your five-year forecast for the major uh, markets and asset classes. Uh, what was uh, truly interesting was uh, the near sameness of equity market returns across all the major markets. Yeah. Uh, begs the question, um, what benefit is um, Ibbotson, what benefit is Markowitz? Why should we diversify at all? 
Yeah, no, uh, and that's a question that actually has come up a lot. People are really suspicious of, of, I can honestly tell you, as being one of the two people that constructed those, that's the way it came out. We went region by region. We looked at the historical profit margin. We put new levels in that we thought were forward-looking. Same for PEs. And it, it had just ended up being really close. Um, I think the, the major point that people have raised is whether the U.S. is too high and the EM is too low. Um, so the U.S. has come out a little stronger because it's been so good at maintaining relatively elevated valuation levels. And that is a fair debate, right? Is that, is that genuinely the way we think about the world, especially with growth versus value evolving the way it has? Or is that too optimistic? So that's been a point of contention. And the other point has been on EM, we have been more cautious. We are a little bit worried about what the Chinese government is doing, and we did put a discount in place because of that. Again, it's a debatable point, uh, but that's the way we've looked at it. But the sum total of those two decisions did lead us to a very close uh, return forecast. So it's not by design, but it is a result of two uh, decisions that we made that are very much open to debate. Right. Um, there was one question uh, which uh, I think is quite interesting here. Just went up the... Okay, I'll ask the question. I, I, uh, forgive me if I've missed the name of the person who asked. Uh, that was on the relevance of India to these, um, uh, to these asset allocation models. Now, China is frequently put up. You put up China as a separate case. Yeah. Um, now, whatever happened last year has or almost made China a non-investable commodity uh, from an investor's perspective. But do you think India now is a, uh, is a separate mainstream uh, category or we are still some time away? It's, it's moving in that direction. We, we, are, not, we are not there yet. Um, but because of the... So the, this, is not, this is related. So India is related to China, not directly, but indirectly. And by that I mean... If we truly start to think about China as a different region, as a different country with its own dynamics, and perhaps even in some cases a difficult to invest country because of the way the government is interjecting itself, then of course the question becomes, should we split China off from the EM index? And as soon as you do that, then India becomes really important in what remains. So it's a related so I think the way it's going to evolve is China is being split off slowly but gradually by more and more asset managers. And then as that happens, what remains, India becomes a big part of that. And that's, especially with the growth that you have, that's when I think India becomes a much right. more important thing. Right. Yeah, the question came from Priyank Tushar. Uh, just got the, the name there. Thanks, Priyank. Um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, another one from um, Mandar. Uh, the question was on natural resources. You, you, uh, uh, you seem to be quite positive, bullish on, on natural resources in general. Um, how does that dovetail uh, with a more sanguine view of inflation for this year? Yeah, well, luckily uh, for all of us, natural resources don't tend to have that big of an impact on structural inflation. It, it flows through the system, but second round effects tend to be rather small. Wages are a much bigger part of the cost component. So even though we're optimistic about natural resources, uh, we don't think it's going to be a sustained uh, inflationary driver. Uh, so that's sort of the way we've structured that argument. Uh, that being said, uh, of course, from an energy perspective, we have seen you know, how, how aggressive the moves can be and how second round effects, especially for, so in Europe, the, the fiscal uh, stimulus has been very substantial, 4% of GDP, and uh, we've seen how wages are now being negotiated, partly on the headline inflation rates, which, of course, is driven by energy prices. Right. So there is, a, there is a sense of humbleness in our, in our process regarding that part of the equation. But in general, uh, we don't think natural resources are going to be a meaningful inflationary driver. We're much more worried about wage growth in that regard than mm. natural resources. There are, there are some obvious questions, a couple of them on, on currency, especially U.S. dollar. And I, I want to dovetail that with another point about this emerging trend towards de-dollarization or attempted de-dollarization of uh, global capital, global trade, and so on and so forth, um, not least because of whatever happened uh, post-Ukraine. Um, what is your sense, uh, both in terms of uh, the trend towards de-dollarization, de how, how much legs does it have, and what impact does it have on... Uh, on U.S. dollar. Last year was... Well, last year taught us once again 
that when the world gets scary, people run to the dollar uh, with all the uh, impact that it has uh, in EM and gold and other parts of the financial market spectrum. So that lesson should be taken seriously. At the same time, and I've written about this for 10 years now, um, I think de-dollarization is real. I think it's going to continue. It's picking up pace. Uh, we've seen how countries are getting more aggressive around disentangling themselves from the dollar payment system. China is leading the charge, but I'm sure India is going to follow suit. Again, regionalization is a big part of that. Pe regions don't want to be dependent on other regions for, for fundamental economic inputs, and this is one of them. Uh, currency payment systems uh, are, are part of that uh, same spectrum. So we do think de-dollarization is picking up. We do expect it um, to continue. And some of the privilege that the dollar has enjoyed is going to erode. But it's going to be slow, right? Because it's not that easy. Uh, and people do flock to safety and that strong dollar once things get a little scary. So it's going to be a long trend, a slow trend, and a bumpy trend, but still a trend nonetheless, because that's the way the world is evolving. Right. Uh, um, just sticking to that point, uh, how does China do that? Um, it's a large net exporter, so it needs to hold something. So without giving us, uh, giving up monetary policy flexibility, how does China uh, uh, kind of move the rest of the world effectively to another currency, uh, which is not dollars, given that it needs the dollars as uh, it runs largest surplus in the world? Yeah, and that's... Well, you're touching on exactly why it's such a slow trend. So the way uh, China's central bank has been doing is been setting up these swap lines with these other central banks. That, that was sort of the, the reason 10 years ago I started writing about this. And what it's trying to do is get more of that regionalized trade with Australia, with the neighboring countries uh, in renminbi, so it can move away from the dollar as an intermediate currency. Swap lines, payment systems are a big part of that. But you're right. For all the exports that it's still doing to the developed world, it's still getting paid in dollars. So it still needs to cycle that through its financial system. And it's still doing that. And of course, Mundell Fleming's impossible uh, Trinity model tells us that the way they're doing it is through capital controls, which, is, which they have still been able to maintain. Mm. Uh, but yeah, they, they build up these reserves, and then they, 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 get the, they get at least some dependency on what the Fed is doing in terms of its monetary policy. So it's not a, it's not a long-term solution for them. But for now, it's still working for them. And, and Releasing that is difficult because the risk is that they get capital flight. So, again, slow trend. They're going to get there in the end, but it's going to be bumpy. So that's right. sort of the way it looks. Interesting question from Prince out there. You put up a five-year dollar forecast. Um, I had the same question, but I thought that. But somebody has asked, so I have to. Uh, so you have a five-year forecast, but we have gray swans all the time, black swans every year. Um, what good are these forecasts? Yeah, so <laughs> that's a good question. So part of the answer is, of course, in that report card slide that I showed, which showed how things turned out much differently at the, at the individual asset class level. So even though I'm, I am and my firm is very humble about the individual asset class forecast that we put out from, on a five-year horizon exactly for that reason, at the same time, we've seen over and over again that once you build a well-diversified portfolio, that strategic uh, forecast still gives you a lot of insight as to where your portfolio is trending. And that may sound like a, okay, that's interesting, but whatever, but it's really important because when you're talking to your clients and you're showing them the efficient frontier, they glaze over. When you tell them, we build a well-constructed, diversified portfolio for you, we will be wrong on U.S. equities versus U.S. high yield versus IG, but we will get this for total portfolio roughly right. That resonates, resonates very, very strongly. So we do still think there's value there, but you have to look at it more from a portfolio perspective than from an individual asset class perspective. Right. Uh, the other interesting bit uh, that I picked up from your presentation was this optimism about real assets private equity, um, et cetera. Um, how much does that owe itself to recency effect, um, the impact of Silicon Valley in the last maybe five, six years, um, and how much of that is real? Uh, because longer term studies uh, show that private equity in the US, for example, over 20, 30 years, probably has made uh, a little bit more money for the GPs than it has made for the LPs. So yeah. uh, where does that uh, optimism stem from? 
Yeah, so now, this is a really interesting debate you're touching on. So, first of all, um, you have to be very open about the fact that the industry as a whole versus the specific managers that you're actually investing in, that's a whole different ballgame, right? The industry as a whole, you're absolutely right. Those numbers don't lie. And, and the, the fees have, have gobbled up most, if not all, of the returns, uh, especially relative to the last 10 years when U.S. equities did so well. In Europe, it's better. Uh, in the U.S., it's worse. Um, so that's, that's certainly part of it. But then, of course, when we make those decisions, we take into consideration the way we're investing in private equity, the managers that we're actually accessing to do the private equity mm. investing. And we are firmly of the opinion that our shown for the last 10 years ability to pick those managers and do much better than the private equity average does still give us a really good uh, alpha term into those forecasts. So that is part of the debate. And of course, we, we back up those numbers with our own real life um, and, and, and actually achieved, uh, back, uh, not back test, but actual achieved results right. in private equity. Right. Um, uh, just uh, maybe the last question before I open it up for others if they want to. Um, you uh, mentioned alpha, that the whole projection on private equity is dependent on your ability to pick somebody who will generate that alpha. Where does this confidence again come from, given what we have seen uh, with alpha on the listed side of things, where it's been a diminishing and largely ephemeral quantity? Yeah, no, again, a good question. So we, we have, uh, for, of course, not only do we have um, a track record that shows that we have the ability to access those managers. By the way, it's not just about being able to identify them. It's also being able to actually get your money in their door, which is not that easy, trust me. Um, so we have a proven track record in doing that. Uh, but it's also, uh, I think, uh, a, a matter of... So the, the way we've done this is we've looked at the studies. And actually, alpha persistence within private equity managers is much better than alpha persistence in equity managers, listed equity managers. So that's the other part. So the way we've structured this argument is we think there's alpha here, but you need the access to get it. We have that access so we can put the return forecast in. But any, any of those two steps you're missing, you should be very careful because it's a, it's a really tough world out there. And you might actually end up overpaying for something that is going to be average, especially in a world where interest rates have moved this much uh, higher this quickly. Private equity is facing a new investment reality out there in the world. And I do think that that requires uh, a lot of skill and recognition to see which managers you think are actually going to be able to manage and navigate that new landscape versus those, those that folks. Right. I'll open this up for questions from uh, the audience, if there are any. I'm sure there is somebody with a, with a mic who can come. Yeah. The lady out there. Um, two o'clock. Someone with the mic. The lady at two o'clock is. Thank you for the amazing presentation. Uh, somewhere in the slide, you mentioned that the next five-year growth is going to come from India. Of course, we understand the India demographics. Uh, the next country that you mentioned is Japan. And you know, interesting times for Japan because uh, you know, there's inflation happening, central bankers are turning hawkish. Where is the growth coming from Japan? So what will drive growth for Japan in the next five years? Thank you. Yeah, no, Japan is, is one of those countries that um, used to be this big part of the global spectrum and we looked at it so closely and then it sort of slipped off the radar for the last five to ten years as it sort of struggled with these long-term problems. And now we're starting to see a renewed pickup in interest in Japan. And I think for the right reasons because even though Japan still faces structural headwinds in terms of its demographic profile, for instance, uh, we're also starting to see uh, cultural and corporate governance changes that are really uh, making it a more interesting and perhaps dynamic place to invest. So when we look at Japan as a, from a growth forecast, first of all, because we do a total economic forecast, Japan always comes out at the bottom of the ranking because of the demographic headwinds. But of course, demographics are only one part of the equation. It's a total pie. But it, what really matters for a country's sort of well-being is GDP per capita. And that's actually where Japan has been very competitive with the Western world in achieving pretty robust growth. How, how has it done so? Through technological development. 
So when we look at Japan from a growth forecast, yes, the absolute growth rate is low, but a per capita growth rate is interesting uh, because of that technological development. And that's really important because when you start to look at the Japanese companies uh, in that spectrum, now all of a sudden you've got actually a good uh, angle to think about where the opportunity is coming from and where the returns might be coming from. And we have seen renewed interest from investors in that space. So Japan has become an interesting place because of that. Uh, but again, uh, you have to take that nuanced view because from a total perspective, there is that headwind in place. Central bank policy, by the way, and, and inflation. Um, I'm actually on the bank with the Bank of Japan on this one. So I'm taking, uh, I'm, I'm going against the markets, which are saying, oh, they need to stop this. I'm actually not so sure. I, I still think that Japan has, has strong disinflationary pressures built into its system, and it needs to overcome those on a sustained basis before yield curve control should be uh, abandoned. And in fact, I see no reason whatsoever why Japan couldn't maintain yield curve control, but with higher rates. So instead of having the, the, the short rate um, process that we have in the Western world, why not have a yield curve control process uh, that can move rates up and down? I, I don't see any reason why it couldn't. And in fact, it might actually be preferable to our approach. So I'm actually modestly optimistic about Japan. Uh, I, I see upside there. As long as you look through the demographic headwinds and focus on what the, uh, what the per capita growth rate is and the technology angle that that brings. Thank you for that. Any other? Yeah, hi, thanks for the presentation. Just one question, when it comes to like this global approach of asset allocation and taking calls on so many things and the world is a random place, so many things can change along the way. So with that context, like when you finally look at a global passive allocation to various asset classes and, and you maybe you, you benchmark that with all the work that say you guys do and with all the fees that come along the way with an active call, what, what are the basis points difference that it makes in terms of the final outcome, say versus a global do nothing passive? Thank you. Sorry, I, I'm not 100% sure I got the core. So I was saying that in terms of if you do a global do nothing passive allocation yes. to global assets yes. versus taking this like multi-country, multi-asset class call and to add to it the active fees that comes with taking these calls. End of the day, what, what basis points difference does it make uh, after do, doing all this effort? Ooh, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, so we do, uh, ooh, I, need to, I need to look into this, but so we do actually provide our clients with model portfolios that are both completely passive as well as largely active. I do think, so in general, I think we should acknowledge that there are asset classes out there where active fees are really hard to, uh, to, to basically warrant themselves. So U.S. equities, even European equities, hard to get good active management with alpha that is sticky. Uh, so that part of the equation, we are already moving largely passive. Um, other parts of the world, EM, uh, still, uh, we're still very much active because we see the opportunities there, but we'll also be seeing managers actually deliver a consistent alpha there. And of course, in private assets, it's all about alpha. It's much less about beta. Um, so if I think about our pure passive solutions relative to our mixed solutions, my guess would be there would be a 50 basis points fee difference. But I would, I would really have to look into it more carefully to, to get you a more precise number. Okay, so last question about uh, uh, the next session is uh, from Anant, who's from SEBI. Don't like to keep the regulator course, waiting. Uh, you'll go to Amsterdam. We'll have to stay and here. The big hawk will come and drag me off. You, you'll go, to, go back to Amsterdam. We'll have to stay here. So uh, uh, last question on gold. Um, India uh, has the uh, largest, you know, we hold the largest gold reserves in private hands in the world. Um, favorite asset class. Uh, surprisingly had a stellar run last year despite interest rates going up so much. What's your view? Yeah, no, I, um, so gold is one of those asset classes that pops up once in a while in our, in our, in our universe. And it's actually popped up recently again as an interesting, uh, an interesting case. That's really because the, the drivers of 2022 are shifting. So we had this big shift in, big rise in real rates and of course rise in the dollar that kept dollar, that kept gold back. Initial surge in, in 2022 and then tailed off, 
and now it's rising again because real rates are starting to come down, the inflationary cycle is turning, and, and gold is turning. And frankly, it doesn't look like those, those trends are about to end. We think both of those trends, real rates coming down because central banks are reaching their plateau, and inflation is coming down, and uh, the dollar uh, uh, losing some of that value that it gained in 2022, we think both of those trends are going to continue. So we are actually a little bit more optimistic about gold this time around. Uh, and the, the, the run that we've, I think it's already up 20% over the last couple of months, uh, I think that has further to run uh, over, over the next of the year. So I know that that goes well in this audience, but I actually did look at it, uh, and I do mean it. So, yeah. great. Thanks, Walter. Thanks for this wonderful yeah. session, and I'm sure you'll be around and, and, yes, and on for one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Thank you.